he is really trying to present this in a way that I think maybe his former self would have appreciated. Fools you know? mock, but they shall mourn. <laughs> I, I don't see him <laughs> mocking, though. I am flat. How is that what you got out of this? I am I am saying, <laughs> Whatever. Play the clip. And yes, this book is definitely full of a lot of like full blown copy and paste jobs from like the Bible. Oh, God. Okay, now this is one of the things that I was like, there's like three or four things that I kind of really take issue with. <laughs> this shares in common with the CES letter the assumption that if you still believe, you're an idiot. I'm say. defending. I, don't even, I barely know the guy. I've seen a couple of his maps, and I'm like, oh, the one thing he did about the Iraq war is cool. And now I feel like I'm his best friend. 63 years after the events that he's describing are supposed to have happened, it's an inaccurate account. There <laughs> might be some kind of prejudice lurking there. The people that purposely dress homeless and eat at Whole Foods, the overpriced oats. I mean, they he's, were tortured. Yeah, he's clearly swallowed this like narrative hook, line, and sinker at this point. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Ward Radio. I'm your host, Cardinalis. I'm joined in the studio by Kwaku L, Brad Whitbeck, and Don Bradley, author of The Lost 116 Pages. And um, we've got a very interesting video that we're doing here today, okay? Uh, it, it's tragic. I, I, I almost hate doing this introduction. Usually I'm very excited, but unfortunately, one of my favorite YouTubers, uh, Johnny Harris, has just engaged in a pretty heavy handed act of anti Mormonism. Um, we, I don't know if I would characterize uh, it that way. No. Uh, what do you mean? Dude, he's dunking on the church using recycled tropes. I, I don't even like, know if he's dunking on the church using recycled tropes. I think he The is. title of the video is look, I, look, you guys can <laughs> defend this cat. It's like, what's the title of the video? It's the real truth of the like. Mm, it, it would the help if real I could see it. story. Oh, you can't see it. Oh, no. here, hold on, hold on. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, that's. Bad. To be fair, we have a video titled "Joseph Smith Killed All the Werewolves." So I mean, <laughs> I, I feel. Bit, look, look. He's a YouTuber. Bro. Class houses. I'm not trying to make any enemies out of this guy either. Okay, I actually corresponded with him to direct a video mm -hmm. uh, when I moved back to Los Angeles, and actually an independent film. Never got back to me, but he already had tons of subs by then. But anyway, yeah, look, here's the title of the video right here, okay? It's the real story of the Mormon church. Come on, that's yeah. loaded with insinuation. Oh, uh, like, for sure, but I mean, we do the same sort of thing. We're YouTubers. I, I think it would be more sure. accurate for him to have titled it My New Understanding of the Mormon Church, right? And I think that'll be a theme throughout this. He, he makes an awful lot of like observations that he says are now like factual truth and mm -hmm. claims to be objective in ways that I don't think are possible for like, okay. really anyone. But I don't no, think really I don't think weird. this is anti-Mormon bunk. OK, before all of us get our disclaimers in, let me finish the intro. <laughs> OK, okay let me finish the intro. <laughs> all right. Thank you. you. Didn't even introduce me. yet. Um, yes, I haven't even gotten to you yet. Oh, so. Yeah. I'm joined in the studio by Quake Oil, Brad Whippick, and Don Badley. We are going to be talking about um, the video. I won't call it anti-Mormon, even though it recycles ex-Mormon, <laughs> anti-Mormon tropes, okay? In conjunction with clips that have been so lovingly provided uh, to us by Clip Master Luke, who is currently now in Washington, D.C., which actually used to be, ironically enough, I believe the stomping grounds of Johnny Harris when um, he used to work for Vice. And actually, that was, um, I believe, the time when I started following him. Uh, so um, prolific is this man's uh, influence upon the internet that now, actually, whenever you see cool maps, they're oftentimes referred to as Johnny Harris maps. Um, stylistically, just like they call it the Ken Burns effect in documentary mm -hmm. filmmaking, when you see a shift in the documentary towards a, um, a, you know, a static picture, they actually call them now Johnny Harris maps because he cut his teeth doing really, really cool long form kind of uh, travel documentaries that involved maps and analyzing borders and so on and so forth. That's so anyway, awesome. he has left the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in a very public way over the past two or three years. And unfortunately, we will not cast aspersions upon his motivations, but has recycled some what I consider tropes, what other people consider viewpoints, like Brad, who is far more ecumenical than I, you know, 
And um, we're going to dive into them and do what I would call a debunking, what Brad might call a discussion, right? You know what I'm saying? And <laughs> I'll, I'll um, be on it. I'll be honest. I watched the whole video. I didn't find much to object to. It just kind of seemed like he was. No, there, there were the, subtleties. There, there were subtleties. Yes. And we'll, we'll get into that nuance and those subtleties, which to me, large doors swing on even the smallest hinges. Yeah. Um, with that said, fair. before we start, with that said, before we start. Um, my suspicion is, and I, I direct myself directly to Johnny Harris, my man, YouTuber to YouTuber. I love your work. You're awesome. You're welcome to come in and um, come to this studio and talk this out any given time. If you feel we uh, misrepresented you in any way, I'll put you up in a hotel, pay for your plane flight. It'll be a fun experience. I'll even buy you and your lovely wife some tickets to Magic Mountain so you have a blast here even if the studio time sucks. All right? So you're welcome to come on in and do that. But I have a suspicion Johnny Harris is a very politically progressive person who for a long time railed on Republicans. But recently, while working at the New York Times, made a video in which he realized and came to the realization that in all these urban centers that he's lived and worked in that have single party rule of Democrats, the Republicans were not the problem. And all these areas where they're not getting the free housing and not getting the homeless uh, That was care, a really, really good video. It, it was a really good video. And he finally realized that, you know, it's actually Democrats that are a problem. I suspect Johnny that if you re approach the faith you were raised in, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with the same eyes wide open, not just towards cynical information that you might be ingesting now, but towards the whole entire picture, maybe by reading works by Don Bradley, who also had a faith crisis, left the church and came back, that maybe just like you realize that, wow, this narrative I've been told about Republicans is bad, and I'm not saying, you know, all of a sudden I'm a big fat conservative, but really, they're not the ones standing in the way. Just like he came around to the New York Times, I think if if you spoke with us, with Kwaku and with Brad and with me in the studio, I, I really think you might come around. So it is with love that we do this debunking. Okay. Discussion. This discussion, all right. <laughs> and you're welcome to come anytime. So now, Brad, now you can say whatever you want to clean up the mess I just made and then <laughs> yeah. introduce Don Bradley. So um, I think, I don't know, Quaker. We both watched the video, and um, you, like you were saying, not a ton of like problems or red flags or anything, right? Saying we believe that the American incest, uh, Indians were the principal ancestors. That silly typo by McConkie in the introduction. It's, it's in the not 20s. even a typo. It's what we'll, McConkie we'll thought. That's we'll fine. Get there. Um, but okay. yeah, like uh, Quaker, you start, and then I'll go. From I mean, there. I just kind of thought it was a journalist's take on the history of Joseph Smith. There really wasn't anything like. Obviously, he doesn't believe, but for a not believer, he was saying this is a visionary man who had an idea of what he wanted and, to create. It's like, all right. And he seemed <laughs> to be sticking like pretty solidly to the majority of what the church actually holds to without getting too deep in the weeds on because two, it, like yeah. made up garbage that we see from a lot of like antis. When he you, except for calling it made up garbage at the end and then saying fair I'll see you in the comments after recycling stupid tropes that have existed since Mormonism Unveiled was written in 1830. Okay, yeah. if, I, if, if, I just, if he started off and he was like no, he's in the smoother. 1800s, a treasure seeker started a cult for sex. Okay. I'd be like, ah, ah, it's one of those. Yeah. I, it's, I mean, this was nicer than most articles Didn't ever written about our church. Though. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a little bit of stuff that I, I don't think is but a, also a good representation, particularly stuff like when he says. If it. you asked me to make a video about John Calvin, it would have been meaner than what Johnny Harris <laughs> did about <laughs> Joseph Smith. Okay, but well, let's I, be honest. I don't think he did a bad job. I, I thought it was fine. And that's what I was going to say. Overall... I think he did a pretty solid job. There's like three or four things in there that I think were very clearly stuff that shows he has a new worldview compared to what he had when he was a member of the church. And I think that is informing the way that he's presenting those things now. Um, not necessarily showing the reality of them. That's that's really my biggest beef with it is when he says it's the real story of the Mormon church. That isn't true. That That isn't the case. The, he is, I, I think it would be much more accurate to say his new understanding of the Mormon story. How about the but, new but framework he's because, accepted out of? <laughs> because even the things that he is saying, like they they kind of have to ignore some of the historical record. But, it, I, but and yeah, that's yeah. a big part of why Don Bradley. We'll get Don to react to this because Don is like the most deep well of knowledge on church history that we've probably ever had on the show. 
Yeah. So without burying the lead, Quaker, do you have to get yeah, out of your system yeah, or can well, we move on? Th- if you think about, though, his audience is mostly people who have no clue about the church. Yeah, mostly and, secular. And, yeah. and you look at the title from that perspective, a normal person is thinking of more. You're thinking of polygamous weirdos in Utah. So when you're saying the real story of the Mormon church and you're saying this is the story of Joseph Smith. Mm hmm. To them, that title is not misleading. I don't think he's claiming this and, is the official narrative. Yeah, and I, because and he I, also opens by saying, "I left this church. Here's my take on it now." Yes, and he's super upfront about that, which I'm super grateful for. Yeah, so I, I, mean, I still think that it is a not the best title, but it's also not the worst. And like you're saying to all of the secular people watching his show who aren't familiar with the church. I think this is actually a much better introduction than something John DeLynn would put out on like understanding Mormonism. You know, dude. At least this the young kids are going to be seeing this. We, we, it was South Park for us. Yeah, we were watching cartoon characters. At least they got John. That. I mean, come on. As always, you know, I hope that Christ advocates for me as heavy-handedly as Brad Whitbeck advocates for Johnny Harris <laughs> <laughs> when I am standing in front of my Maker and being judged and for my. Acts I think Don has something earth. to say too. Okay, Don, hit it. So part of what interests me here is not just his story of Joseph Smith. It's Johnny Harris's story of Johnny Harris. Yeah. Right. So I, having been um, an ex-Mormon before and being now sort of a, a post-post-Mormon or ex-ex-Mormon. Right? <laughs> Double ex-Mormon. Like, yeah. um, Johnny Harris, he, he, the way he talks, says some of what he says, I believe at the end, is that, you know, um, when I was a believing Latter-day Saint, I didn't realize that there were all these things and there's sort of this divide between me and sort of the believers in that, like, as a believer, you are ignoring all these things about Joseph Smith. Mm-hmm. And I've graduated know, into the enlightened right. sphere so of I, secularism. I know, right. I, oh. I'm, I now know and acknowledge the things that the believers don't know or that they don't acknowledge. They sweep under the rug. That's a story that he has not about Joseph Smith, but about himself. And that story mm-hmm. is, you know, I used to believe this. I used to be ignorant. But now I'm, and, 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 and don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm actually not saying this to poke fun at him at all, right? Um, but he's saying sort of, in a sense, now I'm kind of more enlightened, right? Yeah. I, now I know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I actually, this might surprise you, but I actually, when I talk, th- this is the standard ex-Mormon narrative. Oh, very I, much I, so. I participated very much in the culture of ex-Mormonism for several years as an ex-Mormon atheist. Mm -hmm. went to the ex-Mormon conference that they had at the time every year here in Utah. I went to various other ex-Mormon social No, no, not here in Utah, bro. You ain't in Utah. Don't cast those aspersions upon my studio. So I usually... (laughs) Here in Los Angeles. They did not have it in Los Angeles. They had it in Salt Lake. But yes, you're right. Um, I'm used to being in Utah. So um, the... um, I'm very familiar with that subculture. Yeah. And the, the story is like I... I used to think the history of the church was this way, but now I realize it was this way. Like, I have this different picture. Yeah. And what I actually want to say is, like, congratulations. Like, you learned that some of the things were not the way that you thought they were. Yeah. But now the sense that, like, I've graduated, now I get it, now I really know, that sense can actually block us from seeking further information, yeah. right? It's and so in, in my own journey... Right. Like I was I was where Johnny Harris is 100 mm-hmm. percent. Right. And then I learned more like I didn't have to give up the things that I learned about church history, the more difficult, complicating things yeah. in order to come back. Mm-hmm. Rather, I learned more that put that all of that into a larger perspective. And I, I brought all that knowledge with me. So now I can look back not just to like. Um, having been, you know, a believing Latter-day Saint the first time from the vantage point of being an ex-Mormon, now I can look back on being an ex-Mormon from the vantage point of being a re-Mormon, yeah. right? And, like, I see things that Johnny Harris is not seeing. So, so this sense, it's understandable. I've learned more than I knew. I have a different picture. That's great. Mm-hmm. Now, what else is there, right? If your curiosity ends there, so is your journey, so is your understanding going to end there. But I'm yeah. telling you there's more. Yeah. Okay, so. so can we dive right in? Yeah, yeah let's, let's dive do right it. in. Okay, Clipmaster Luke, before we start, thank you very much for providing us with these clips. And uh, we are just going to dive right in 
with uh, the very first one here. Here is uh, Johnny Harris uh, speaking about, of course, I probably should have pulled it up, speaking about the context of Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was born in the perfect place at the perfect time. It was the early 1800s, and the U.S. had just thrown off England to become a new country, and it was going through some massive growing pains. Dude, there's the Johnny Harris maps. It's just cool. And Most I of love these new Americans animation. who it's just... Yeah, it's pretty cool. They're so good. ...left the old world, rejected a lot of old world things, namely religion. Only 10% of white Americans regularly attended church at this time. So to help revive God, you have all these super charismatic preachers who... Okay, now this was the only first one where I just thought, hold on a second. I, I'm not saying I want to fact check this, but I know that there's a reason why Mark Twain said there's lies, there's damn lies, and there's statistics. To say that only 10% of the people went to church at that time, it, I feel like he was using that stat to insinuate, and I'm, I'm only nitpicking this because I want to make sure that I do set up the proper historical context here. I, I feel like, yeah, just because maybe only 10% went, well, that plays actually into the narrative of Joseph Smith, that there was a fervor on revivals, and there wasn't a lot of just like brick and mortar towns out in rural Vermont. You know, the the weekly attendance that could have easily just been influenced by the proximity and availability of buildings. Correct, Don Bradley? So, so Not necessarily uh, yeah. the disbelief of the 90 so, percent. So as a historian of American religion, yes. right, I can tell you that although most people did not belong to a church at the time, the American people were overwhelmingly religious believers. They were overwhelmingly Christian. There just was a tendency among Americans of the time to not formally affiliate with the church. So the idea, the picture that's being presented is the Americans were largely a sort of irreligious people, and therefore this would have provided maybe a motivation for Joseph Smith to kind of evangelize them or something actually the american people were very religiously believing they just didn't tend to belong to formal churches okay yeah that one kind of made my, my spidey senses tingled on that mm -hmm. one but we'll continue so to help revive god you have all these super charismatic preachers who left the cities and went out to the countryside to preach but you can kind of imagine like this brand new country. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. What are you going to yeah. say, Quaker? Okay. <laughs> I, lo I love Johnny Harris's videos. I uh -huh. think he's one of the best YouTubers. The framing, this whole video bothered me. Why is he so, it's like just a little bit higher. Why is he like <laughs> that space at the top? Why is that yeah, there? It's, yeah, it's it, a lot of headroom. Yeah, I, it's. It, he's His not eyes are almost below center. Yeah, it's not following the rule of thirds. And I kind of wonder, like for such a visually stunning artist, uh, is he trying to do like some kind of new Dutch angle? He invented Johnny Harris maps. Maybe he's just inventing Johnny Harris headroom. Well, honestly, <laughs> <You know>? okay. <laughs> we're we're going to get to this. Theory. And you know, in, in film, sometimes they'll they'll do the camera a little off. It's called a Dutch angle. A yeah. Angle when they're supposed to be a bad guy. Yeah. Maybe. And and the music, the music I was noticing kind of does this. Maybe it's supposed to give you a slightly unsettled vibe throughout the whole thing. Maybe and if you're not a video savvy person, you can't put your finger on. Yeah, and, and you, uh, so you, then you, you attribute <laughs> it to the Mormonism. Can I tell you what I and, and I think that I I want to jump on what Luke is saying here because I think he does something really similar with some of the animations. As soon as Joseph Smith starts having visions, the mm. you have really really good like normal fun illustrations, but when you have Joseph having visions, I I wonder if this will show up in the clips. They start doing this like, you know, outside a car dealership, how they have like those floppy things yeah. going up. They start kind of like waving like that and it gets like almost weirdly psychedelic in a way. And it's kind of unnerving. And I wonder if it was done that way on purpose. Yeah. Well, like, here, here's my thought is one, it is ironic that we're talking about the Johnny Harris's like positioning when. Luke's in the exact same position. I was going to say, uh, Luke's got a lot of headroom on Zoom. Luke's but, got a lot of headroom on right Zoom. But, <laughs> yeah. but the other it thing was is, intentional. But see, see, that's not me intentionally doing something. That's just my... I don't think he was intentional. You know and, and, and it may right not be now. intentional, too. I yeah. think he filmed the whole thing and then had a, had to upload it and realize like the guy behind the camera watching it or something was j had just being an idiot and just had it sunk too much and he was like I don't have the energy to do Okay, to well do let's that. get that's, to the clip. Honestly, that's, that's what I think most probably happened. Yeah. Okay, here's the clip. Checking it out. Go. Side to preach, but you can kind of imagine like this brand new country founded on these new ideals. It was unprecedented times. So a lot of these new churches that were cropping up 
kind of claimed to be the place that was preparing the earth for the second coming. Like they were God's chosen administrators on the earth in the final days before it all ended. It was scary, it was exciting, and God was talking to people again. Yeah, and he had some interns really rocking mid-journey. Yeah, for like, real. You know Those mid-journey like images this. are great. Yeah, that was some pretty killer mid-journey, man. So anyway, let's keep going. Johnny Harris. In, in new ways. And this is the context that Joseph Smith was born into. Yeah, so that's actually Emma Smith. That's Joseph's wife, not his mom. Oh, oh man, he got the picture wrong, too? Yeah, I mean, it's not a super big deal. He does this deal. a couple like, of times. Yeah. Really? Where it's like, how far did you research this? I, I have some questions. Is it like well, when Peggy Fletcher well, stacked? I, I can tell you how that error probably occurred. I mean, somebody somebody Googles baby Joseph Smith, and what they come up with is an image of not of Joseph Smith as a baby, since there isn't one. They come mm -hmm. up with an image of Joseph Smith's baby. I'll make my case for that a little more um, with a later thing that he says. Uh, yeah, but this one also s doesn't super matter. It's just like yeah. no, an image illustrating just, like yeah, a, I'm an not early 1800s mom. Okay, you know? yeah. let's go. Let's go. We got to burn through these clips here. Upstate New York was also a place where people hunted for treasure. There was this oh, culture of Lord. folk magic and legends that led to the search for riches and jewels that were potentially buried by Spanish explorers or oh, pirates yeah. of the past or <laughs> artifacts that were hidden in Native American burial mounds. And young Joseph Smith... Another awesome mid-journey image, go mid-journey. Was very caught up in this treasure hunting craze. He wasn't religious, but so from a young pause. age. So he, he wasn't religious, but from a young age, he showed himself able to make up stories or whatever he said. Um, this is something he repeats a few times. Yeah. That young Joseph Smith wasn't religious. And that gives the impression, along with his idea that, well, he, he was into the treasure seeking and he was good at making up stories that... You know, Joseph Smith is a con man, right? So he's he's not religious, but he's motivated by, you know, being a storyteller, um, being, you know, wanting treasure or whatever. Yeah. And so where is he getting this idea that Joseph Smith was not religious? I mean, there's, there's nothing that I know to indicate this. I, and we have his mother's um, family memoir where she writes... Uh, she's talking about a religious conversation they had when Joseph was growing up as a family. And she says, Joseph never said many words upon any subject, but always seemed to reflect more deeply than common persons of his age upon everything of a religious nature. So even when he's a young kid, mm -hmm. he's always thinking deeply about religion. And then she also writes about how when she would go to church, to the Presbyterian church, he didn't agree with the Presbyterians, he would stay in the woods and read his Bible. That's the kind of non-religious kid so, he was. if I can defend Johnny Harris for a second here, I think he's using a vernacular more familiar to him where he would maybe now, I don't know where he's at, if he's atheist at this point or not, but there's an awful lot of people who, upon leaving their religion, will say that they are not religious but spiritual and that he may be kind of thinking about it in that way, that Joseph Smith was spiritual in his upbringing, but not religious. But that, in the way that he's yeah. presenting it here, it comes across as though he I, didn't I, I mean, I, have any religious yeah, interest. I right? like to be charitable to people, um, and I don't begrudge him anything, right? I do yeah. think that if that's possible, but I think, I suspect that if that's what he meant, he probably would have said something like spiritual but not religious since that is such a common category. That's fair. In any case, it does, it has the effect of setting it up that Joseph Smith is not really, a, really religiously motivated. That's fair. Which is not, not true. What we can see. It's just yeah. not accurate. Okay. It, according to the rest, like the overwhelming evidence. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's continue. As a skilled treasure hunter. I mean, let's keep some perspective. In all of our research, we didn't find a single like document showing that he actually found any treasure, but he managed to convey to the people around him that he was hmm. an expert treasure hunter and that using mythical pause. methods. That yeah. again is another time that he's trying to reinforce this like superpower of storytelling that Joseph Smith has. Um, which I think like you're saying is there to set up for painting him as a con man later. Yeah. 
I, I was going to say, well, at least he's picked a lane. I give him credit. He's going to stay in that lane, unlike other anti-Mormons who say he was an idiot until it gets time to call him the evil genius, at which time it gets called to, time to call him the con man, at which time we'll it gets to time that. to call him the pious fraud. You know, so at least he's picking a lane. What do you have to say, Luke? And, and here's the thing with this clip. He says, in all our research, we didn't find such and such. And it seems to give the impression that this video is um, advertising itself as exhaustively researched. researched. Yeah. Where, but then you're getting the Joseph Smith's mom picture wrong. And yeah. he's going to say a couple of things here in the future that are like, eh, not completely wrong, like Mike Winger wrong or Lynn Wilder wrong, but uh -huh. <laughs> still not historically rigorous. But, yeah. but, and, but. and so I, I think it's it's heightening. People are making this to be fair, though, than it actually I, is. I knew that was a, a Emma, but I didn't take that photo as saying this is young joseph it was just contextual. establishing setting yeah yeah i yeah. I, I, I don't i, I don't, I don't think the i don't think there was any attempt at deceit or anything and i don't think it's a big deal or, or a yeah. claim i think it was just right. i think it, it was just cool. to set the so we all agree enough about the picture let's move on to see what the substance is um to me it's it's just like i didn't like mike winger saying he was an expert on mormonism and then just start recycling tropes i don't like it if you do represent yourself as your research being exhaustive which is basically what he said when he said in all of our research of this um you're you can't be recycling some of these tropes we're going to get to later if it is to be fair he does have part two coming out there, there is actually a circularity to that argument too because Joseph does find the golden plates, mm -hmm. and those are handled by witnesses, like they're witnesses who say, we saw these and handled these. And if, if someone tells me that they found an object, that may not be great evidence for it, but if other people see and handle the object, that is evidence. And Whether it's enough evidence, maybe an open question, but there is evidence, so he's assuming Joseph didn't really find the plates, that the testimonies, the witnesses don't count, yeah. and then that gets factored into his story. And on top of the witnesses themselves, all of the people that tried to get the plates from him, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I, I think he, that's a really good point, Don, mm -hmm. that like he did mm -hmm. find the gold plates. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Let's continue. Clip number two about the Book of Mormon right here. Moroni tells him that there is a book that is written on golden plates that is buried in a hill near Joseph's house. And don't worry, says Moroni, along with the plates, there's the gear you need to translate these plates into English. Joseph just needs to get a bit older and he'll be ready to translate the plates. Okay, so now Joseph Smith, in his 20s, he's this uneducated, unreligious treasure hunter. Okay, um, would you feel that's a fair unreligious, uneducated treasure hunter is a fair <laughs> characterization of Joseph Smith at this time as probably the number one scholar of Joseph Smith in North America at this point. <laughs> Just scale of one to ten, how would you rate that? No. Um, Joseph Smith's primary vocation in life at that point was that he was a farmer. Um, treasure hunting, things that they did were occasional. Um, and definitely, according to his own family, he was quite religious and so and to the yeah. non to, to the secular person out there or the non-denominational the non-mormon person out there the reason why this perks me up so much is because jews for example there's just tropes that get recycled in anti-semitic literature and jokes and pictures and caricatures that are obvious um obviously just cruel and fraudulent and have definitely stood the test of time right and one of the most cruel and fraudulent tropes against joseph smith that has existed since the 1830s is this idea that he was nothing but a menial treasure digger okay and so just like i can't even say what the anti-semitic tropes are here to compare them to the anti-mormon tropes but this is really one of the most heavily debunked tropes that joseph smith even addressed in his own lifetime before he died yet here in a video that's being represented as exhaustively researched and we're the getting, real story of mormonism and the real story of mormonism we're getting nothing more than a recycled anti-mormon trope so let us continue in the words of one for, for Don. oh yeah what's your one question um do we have an estimate in terms of like months that joseph smith spent on this uh, the treasure digging oh no the Dan Vogel, Would you say we have high confidence that it's less than a certain amount of time? 
my my offhand memory on that is not good enough. I think that Dan Vogel years ago came up with a list of a dozen or so digs that Joseph Smith reportedly was involved in. Um, these digs hired been, laborers. I think these digs would have been all probably from 1824 to 1826. He stops doing the treasure digging in something like February of 1826. So it's mm. it's not a long. It's it's maybe like two years. Um, several and digs in across 1824 would years. have placed it after Moroni came. A- after then? Moroni, yeah. I would place, so he's not even yeah. a treasure digger before. No, he starts talking and about so the that's Book of that's significant. Yeah, because he's framing it that Joseph Smith is a treasure digger, and then his like a- angelic claims pop up, but actually he's only a treasure digger for a while, it appears after Moroni comes and before he gets the plates. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's it's not a fair representation of Joseph Smith that is not historically accurate. Okay, that's, that's what it boils down to. So let's keep going. The unreligious treasure hunter, in the words of one believing Mormon historian, Richard Bushman, he starts to orient himself away from treasure and towards translation. He would sit on one side of a- By the way, Brad, I don't know if you caught it, but that was the weird eerie head bob that yeah. you were talking about that yeah, was done. The, look and at how off kilter his head gets. It like goes just a little farther than it should, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, it's kind of like me, the exorcist. <laughs> yeah, that some of that stuff as you watch through, if you watch through it again and watch for that, it appears intentional to me, you mm-hmm. know? When they do like a couple of things where they just go a little too far, it's like to signal to you something's off about this. Yeah, exactly. It's at best considered not flattering. And they did give him, though, the all-powerful God eye flash. Look at that. I think that's just him blinking, but it comes across that way. I just, I would like it to be symbolic of all power. You know what I'm saying? That's just... Okay, so here we go. He would sit on one side of a curtain so that no one else could see. And he says he looked through these stones at the Egyptian engravings on these golden plates, and they would turn into English. And then he would dictate them out loud to a scribe. At other points, Joseph didn't even need the plates to translate. He could hide them somewhere else. And he would use his personal seer stone. He would put it into a hat. And then he would bury his face in the hat. And he said that the stone would light up with the words that he was supposed Pause. to dictate to his scribe. Okay. Of- um, that's mostly just fine. It wasn't him that said that, though. Actually, that's I like have a point to old make on David that. Whitmer remembrance, right? This gets fuzzy. Yeah. There are there is at least one case where Whitmer in an interview reportedly said Joseph told us that this is what he would experience when he looked in the hat. Mm. Um, I would have to double check that source to see how much it looks like the interviewer is actually keeping David Whitmer's own words and how much he might be adding because newspaper interviewers often did mm-hmm. rephrase. But I mean, I think there are some things that would point to Joseph Smith saying it, but in general, we have accounts from people who are removed from the process, so we shouldn't assume too much about what we know, yeah. but, but that is consistent with the various historical yeah. sources. And, and I would say it's a pretty fair representation of the translation. It just seems a lot more like confident mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. how it happened mm-hmm. than the actual history. Well, plus, is. this is just one of the uh, this is just one of the things that all of the ex Mormon anti Mormons, the same people that group thunk and uh, crowd uh, crowd sourced the CES letter, are obsessed with. And you know, uh, is is that image with a taper? Well, are practically uh, the, the literally the icons of the anti Mormon ex Mormon movement. Here, here's so, I mean, here's the thing that bugs me most about this is how much this gets framed as like a. Real version. Well, no, 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 no. The, this particular portion of this translation gets framed away from what is actually the most common thing. By the way, if they were doing exhaustive research, the most common way that the plates are described, all of these records, they're described as being translated by the gift and power of God. And I think if they were going to present the real thing, I would definitely want to nod to that. More than just like, uh, hey, he used these weird spectacles and this weird magic rock in a hat, right? It's like, to Joseph Smith, these are clearly gifts of God, you know? Right. And well, he keeps framing this as like a non-religious thing, which I don't... 
Because I was going to say, obviously, accurate. he's fully secularized at this point, and the secular can't believe that anything happened through the gift and power of God. Therefore, there must be a logical positive, positivist and, and at naturalist the very explanation. Least, even if he's looking at it from a secular angle, he's got to admit Joseph Smith saw this as a religious thing, mm-hmm. you yeah. know? Okay, cool. Let's keep going that he was supposed to dictate to his scribe. All of this seems really weird and wild to us now, very easily like, okay, clearly this guy's making it up. Well, you could only think that if you hadn't done the complete and total research. I, uh, Don't do this to me, Johnny. Come on, bro. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to defend you. Don't say this is obviously fake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, like, okay. Well, we can't be offended by that. Like, remember, he did leave the church. He doesn't believe in oh, it. Oh, no, no. I'm not offended by it. I'm just, dang it. Yeah, you're just like, dang it. Okay, let's watch that again. Keep going. Be like, okay, clearly this guy's making it up. But at the time, mystical visions and treasure hunting and seer stones, this was all very normal in society. Joseph had been doing and stuff I do like this for a that. decade. Like saying this was all very relatively he, normal in society. He's trying there to do a kind of sympathetic take. Yeah. So I'll it is that. also like common in society now. You know how many, we've had an uptick in psychics and psychic readings in the past five years. More and more people are becoming psychics and like tarot and all that oh, stuff. Oh, and don't even get started on witch talk. Oh. Yeah. Wow. You read the guy who challenged all the witches on TikTok to hex him and his life's been going horribly for a week? Oh, no, really? <laughs> he said he woke up and his house smells like sulfur. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's a real guy. It's and like there's the- this goat that keeps staring through his window at him. <laughs> Dude, there is a, he needs to literally get a movie producer to buy the rights to his life story right now before somebody steals it. Like, I tempted Wiccan and witch talk on TikTok to curse me and now it's working like oh, that's that a freaking is video that's a that's a viral documentary right okay there. you know we're doing it man holy smoke okay back I'm to johnny harris <laughs> which is after me I, I get a little wary like people use this we're so smart nowadays type of thing well obviously now it seems like this but back then those idiots we're living in a culture that can't define the word woman and wants to chop certain things off of 15 year olds like i i get I, sure, they believe some things back then that we've. We have rampant science. obesity and depression that previous generations didn't have. Yeah, like it's very it, presentist to make these arguments that now it's better and the ancients were stupid. Well, Luke, yeah. um, I think this is just another point that goes along with what Don was saying earlier. This is the standard ex-Mormon narrative. It is. Like one hundred percent, this is the standard. Hey, I'm now enlightened, and although he he is trying to present it sympathetically, I right? agree. He's trying to say yes. like mm-hmm. we know obviously that this kind of thing would be total garbage, but like people at the time, and I really appreciate to get you to that. understand why. People oh, so would he's noble. This and oh, this it. isn't the same old crap that they can't help themselves from <laughs> saying. No, no. Oh, it's a noble endeavor. Yeah, like, no, okay. but look, think about this. John DeLynn at this point would have been like, he was a pedophile. And like, yeah. it wouldn't have uh, also, I probably think friends with Tim Ballard. We have yeah. to make yeah. we have to make a fair uh, delineation of crit- critiquing because we can't expect this guy to say, oh, this has all happened, not believe it. He's not trying to pull anyone away from their faith with this video, which is no. why I don't think it. We can say it's anti. And and I think you don't think by insinuating you're stupid if you believe that that not that's not a form. Of I, an attack. Uh, I don't. Th- these are the guys see, that believe but, in microaggressions. But I don't think that's his intent at all, right? Well, we don't know if he does. We're just. <laughs> yeah. I think you took journalists and you just assumed he's kind of liberal and sp- you know you're putting some. No, he self declares as a social justice activist in oh. many of his videos. He talks. He's very about, liberal. Oh. Yes. Well, I, I mean, think about it this way: if I did a video about the Trinity, I could say now. Obviously, we know this doesn't make any sense. Yes. But it doesn't mean I'm telling all the the the, the Lutherans to leave their parish or whatever. He's, he's you know? using this so. as a device that's showing how he understands his audience which he maybe does. i so feel he the most his audience but he wants his audience to have some sympathy for the early mormons exactly. so I, I think like mm-hmm. as far as sins of presentation of the past this is certainly not one of the worst Cardin, I think I, you're look, so i'm jaded. the da i'm the da bro <laughs> i think you're you know? jaded i think you're so jaded from doing anti-mormon stuff for the past couple of years 
Now you, uh, he's he's you're, you're, you're also I am jaded. Board. I am jaded against. I have a I have a soft spot in my heart, and I'm simultaneously jaded against the beanie wearing hipster New York filmmaker. Like <laughs> I, I I will admit, like I guarantee you, Johnny Harris unironically wears a beanie quite often. And I got to tell you, I did enough promo <laughs> work in Williamsburg, just like uh, just to what tell you, man. Of, what kind of like critique is that? This dude, he wears a beanie. go to New York. <laughs> go to New York. I have. No, these are the guys like, oh, you live in Staten Island? Like, that is so first wave. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, just, I have I no just, clue what that even means. Yeah, just go, live in New York. Like, look, Johnny, when you come on the show, bro, we'll talk about funny hipsters. And I'm sorry if half of them are your friends. I could never live in New York. But, oh, you'd love oh, it. Well, I love not it so now. Much. I love New York. Oh. I would move back in a heartbeat. Okay, cool. Well, either way, we're going back yeah. to Johnny Harris right now. Let's see what he has to I'm say. I'm defending. I, don't even, I barely know the guy. I've seen a couple of his maps, and I'm like, oh, the one thing he did about the Iraq war is cool. And now I feel like I'm his best friend. I feel like <laughs> I'm like the guy who's. Hey, look, that's I said, good. I'm the DA. Brad is the defense. Quake, who is the defense's assistant, who's doing a better job than the defense. He looks like Joseph now, Smith. <laughs> Does he it kind of looks like Joe Smith. A little bit. I mean, if he shaved, bit. poofed up his hair yeah. a little bit, like that Donny Osmond kind of thing. He looked yeah. like Joe Smith. Yeah. Okay, a little so bit more, yeah. Well, if he had a beanie, then he'd look like all the other filmmakers. <laughs> <laughs> it's been wild to us now. Very easily, like, okay, clearly this guy's making it up. But at the time, mystical visions and treasure hunting and seer stones, this was all very normal in society. Joseph had been doing stuff like this for a decade, which is why his parents and other people in his community supported him. So the Book of Mormon is incredibly important to this story because it was the main validator for Joseph Smith in those early days and continues to be a foundational part for believers in the LDS faith. Hey, I actually agree with that sentence. Awesome. That's because Joseph Smith wasn't religious or educated and now suddenly he's writing this Bible-like book in a few months. Okay, we kind of already debunked that one, didn't we, Don Bradley? It's the third time he has said Joseph Smith was not religious. Yeah, trying to really nail that home. When when clearly Joseph Smith, if you study the records, believed this was a endeavor for God. I okay. think he's saying not religious in the sense that when the church does the Joseph Smith videos, they say he hadn't even fully read the Bible. He didn't actively go to church. He would go sometimes. He wasn't like... I. That's the way I tried he to defend him, too. He also earlier but. said unreligious... Which seems to really have a connotation of just not being, not being. Again, his shirt is also wrinkled. What if he just rushed this? <laughs> that could be no, the he, case. That could totally. I be the legitimately case. think he. No, he, we're, he we're gonna debunk Quaku right now. He said this is a really important video to him that he's been thinking about doing for years. So why do you have a coat rack? Move it. <laughs> yeah, move uh, your coat rack. <laughs> he always makes fun of something in your picture when he every, feels cornered. I was waiting for you to, every, every time Luke's cornered. on camera, I have to find something to, and he's been putting less and less in the background, so I have less to work with. Okay. I'm always going to get you. I, I am in an Airbnb right now in Indianapolis. I've never been to Indiana before. Okay. Oh. Bedside tables and my luggage. Okay, so here we go. Let's let him finish what he's got to say. Johnny Harris. And yes, this book is definitely full of a lot of like full blown copy and paste jobs from like the Bible. Oh, God. Okay, now this is one of the things that I was like, there's like three or four things that I kind of really take issue with. Presenting it as copy and paste jobs from the Bible is like a really, really, really stupid way to say that. Like, I don't know who did his research for him, but like, you, you got to quotations from the Bible, quotations right. from the Bible could work. But also, even when you look at the parts where he's quoting Isaiah, there are significant differences where when you compare things like out of the half of quotes that are like in there from the Bible, like it kind of comes out in the Book of Mormon's favor. It's more accurate. But, in its in its variations that it has. Yeah, th my only actual critique of the video is that part because if you went on a mission, you know the copy and paste jobs are quoting specific records of the Old Testament that are also quoted later in the Bible and in the New but Testament. I would argue that even then, you have things that like have variations in them that are decently significant. No, I agree. I agree. But it's it's not like, and yay, I Nephi. Uh, you know, did name my son Seth after like it's not like he was. It's quoting. It's it's, it's not a what? copy and paste job. Like he's quoting these prophets are clearly quoting records, and you had mm -hmm. to explain that. Yeah. If you're a missionary, why it's Jesus is going to say yeah. the same thing here. As this, and now here. we know from 
the Quaku version of the Book of Mormon that Nephi, Nephi had a son named Seth. We never knew that before. Yeah. Uh-huh. No. Yeah. Well, All again, I got to say that's from important. Genesis, right? You would see that if that was the kind of quoting it was, you'd be like, mm-hmm. oh, that's a copy and paste job. Yeah. But it's not that. It's like when Christ quotes the book of Enoch, you don't go, the New Testament has all these Jewish po- copy and paste quote draws from the right. ancients. Like, no, he. he so. all, all, all I got to say, all I got to say is I had a friend once whose last name was Rothschild. Ugh. His last name was Rothschild. Well, see, that exact crap right there. He was just so tired of, he was just a regular kid from Southern California, and the amount of crap and tropes that he would just get dumped in his lap of recycled crappy, uh, at worst white supremacist, at best bad comedy, you know what I'm saying? Tropes that would just get like leveled at him that he just had to endure. Like this whole treasure digger trope, you know what I'm saying? This I, whole, what's this last trope that he just recycled? The copy and paste job. Like right. that's, copy and paste tribes from Duro, Isaiah. Stu- 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 Carden, you know, I get like, what you're saying, so, but I also have a cousin okay. and his name is Owen and he's the second, okay? And so he's Owen Jr. and he's about 6'3 and he's built like a football player and he was like, I am not walking around with the name OJ as a six foot yeah. <laughs> <that> black guy. <laughs> He would have it coming if he said his name was OJ. You can't expect the jokes not to. If your last name's Rothschild at the height of conspiracies, maybe go by, I don't know, Rudy? There's a number of things you could do, okay? <laughs> so on so some say? of these things, I think we can somewhat let him off easy because we're looking at the variations between what he says and like an optimally accurate presentation, but we're forgetting. I just realized I've been forgetting. He's there are much summary. worse ways that people could frame this. So what's the usual thing? So so Jeremy Ronalds and those folks, they're not going to call this copy and paste job. They're going to call it plagiarism, plagiarism yeah. right? And so he's actually mm-hmm. avoiding uh, the more that's pejorative true. That's fair. Term. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. And so the he's DA actually, doesn't like this. He's As the trying, DA, I don't he's, like he's this. He's trying to take a more middle That is path, true. Even while expressing and, his own non-belief. Yeah, which, and I guess... He does do a lot of that. And Cardin, this, I think, is something that we've kind of ignored up to this point. He is really trying to present this in a way that I think maybe his former self would have appreciated. Fools mock, but they shall mourn. (laughs) I I don't see him (laughs) mocking, though, you know? I I, I think he's being this way. Like you're saying, Don, he's not going the full-on plagiarism route. He's just saying it in a different way that isn't as pejorative. The way he's going to tell the story is necessarily going to be negative and non-believing because he doesn't believe. Right? Okay. I mean, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah. so uh, all right, let's keep well, going. Let's well, go. Here's the thing Here's the thing with the Book of Mormon stuff, though, is pointing out that several chapters come from the New Testament doesn't explain the Book of Mormon. At all. Like if, he needed to, if he needed to plagiarize 12% of it, why did he not need to plagiarize the other 88%? Like, w- when you look at these theories a little bit closer, they've only hinted at giving an explanation. And Jesus the Christ Mormon. quotes the Old Testament. They Are you going to call the New Testament uh, just a fraudulent copy? But, Was Jesus Christ yeah, copy but, and pasting in Isaiah? What I'm trying to point out is that there is no, and I don't think there ever has been, an actual viable alternative theory to the Book of Mormon. But I think a lot of people just watching this stuff yeah. And and so I'm not attacking him. I'm not saying he's doing this intentionally. And maybe Don could um, say what he thought when he was outside of the church. But that's only, I mean, you're maybe 3% of the way to explaining the Book of Mormon. Yeah. And, and I think. Talk about the plagiarism stuff. But people just think, oh, we said something negative about the Book of Mormon. Therefore, we've disproved it. But you, you're not even close. And, and I think this is part of why he's tried to establish Joseph Smith as a really good storyteller early mm-hmm. on, right? Yeah. He's trying to set up this narrative that Joseph Smith was really good at making things up. But even if you were a good storyteller, within what was it, Don? Like 80 days, he ended up doing 600 pages in Spanish. Uh, my Book of Mormon was like 642 pages. It's like 538 in English. Like he had to have story told, memorized, and cohesively regurgitated almost 20 pages a day, if you want to do the math. And no good storyteller is all of a sudden to become a... a Able to become uh, the CIA's number one photographic memory, uh, you know, story regurgitator. And and here's the thing. I mean, having now written my own fictional book that is uh, uh, like like around 530 pages, it's pretty close. Uh, I don't know how he would have done that. You know, yeah. you know the took, word count on yours, Brad. 
Word count on mine? Yeah. Oh, what am I at? 135,000? Okay. Book yeah. of Mormon's 269. 269. So you need to about right, double yours. Exactly. Hmm. Whoa. Dude. And how, yeah. long did, how long did it take you to write yours, then double it? And like two years, yeah. you know, and, and we had computers, you know, and yeah. it, it, like co-authoring it with my wife actually made it take longer. So when I see people who are like, well, he maybe worked with like Oliver Cowdery and I'm like, that would have made it worse. <laughs> like <laughs> you don't realize that co-authoring it introduces way Ooh, more problems than it solves. Okay. Co-authoring would have made it harder to keep a coherent story because you'd be blending ideas from yeah. different people on mm-hmm. the fly. So, so Don, when you were outside of the church, did you believe that you had a fully viable alternative theory to the Book of Mormon? Or did you say, I have so many other evidences that although I don't really have an explanation for the Book of Mormon, in the balance, I reject I it. I was working on an explanation of the Book of Mormon text of the narratives. Um, that was one of the one of the things that I felt that naturalistic explanations really had not done a good job with at all. That they had just mistaken attributing authorship to really explaining how someone would have come up with the narratives. So that that was something that I really wanted to work on and was was attempting. But my view at the time was that, like I said, other attempts to give a naturalistic explanation of the book had fallen far short Hmm. okay all right well here we go and if you had explained the text of the book of mormon that still doesn't explain the plates Mm -hmm. and the visions and and the the really really solid witnesses but there's also like a lot of really compelling stuff in here the introduction to my book of mormon says the lamanites these people came over from jerusalem are, quote, the principal ancestors of the American Indians. And a few years ago, they did change that to the Lamanites being among the ancestors of the American Indians. And unsurprisingly, there's a whole community of believers who work to validate that this is actually a historic record. But no, in reality, there's no archaeological, genetic, or linguistic evidence that supports the Book of Mormon's assertion that Jewish people migrated to the Americas around 600 BC. Oh, here we go. And there's the little mark. <laughs> Feral the us folks. Just, I'll see you in the comments. <laughs> that, I'm I sorry. Think that's like funny. An interesting. I think that's awesome that he did that. It, that's okay. so funny. That's no, the, the, like, I, the fact that he laid a little <laughs> comment down, that is funny. But again, this is, you want to say you're well researched. This is one of the most low hanging, silly fruits. Uh, uh, of arguments against the Book of Mormon that has been debunked so ad nauseum. It's like saying, you better not eat before you go swimming because you know that'll give you cramps. You know, it's just... I will say, though, I think him saying fair LDS, folks, will see you in the comments. If you don't know anything about our church, which is going to be the bulk of his audience, you don't know what fair LDS is. Mm -hmm. And so you're not going to know what that means. You're going to look it up. Uh So in a way, he did toss meat to the lions over there who are fair LDS. I don't think he's being negative here. I think he's... Because, remember, the, the, the the main getaway when you Google that is oh yeah there's no uh there's no evidence for any of this and then you scroll a little more and there's people saying there is evidence as a journalist he can't say um there's it's okay it's fair to say that some ancient jews sailed to like his buddies the beanie people you talk about yeah he he's completely with the establishment he's, on the like view of ancient america right but Once he watches that, more Graham Hancock, he might change his tune a little, but right? By putting but that comment the in, thing is, I think it's his way of acknowledging and telling the audience, go find it. And also uh, legitimizing himself to his audience as well. You know? Oh, and John DeLynn, no, he's not an anti-Mormon either. He's just a critic, you know, with some good I know, but think about if, if, he, if he has said, here's a great resource, look at the Mormon Stories podcast where they talk about ancient. He didn't say that. He he's not, said he's not out here pumping these guys. Okay, well, let's debunk this. In the 1920s, when they were coming out with a new edition of the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon it treats uh, ancient natives with an incredible amount of respect because um, there's a belief that somewhere in the annals of history, okay, a remnant of 
the lost civilization of the Nephites and Lamanites would have to be among them if you believe that in 600 BC, Nephi or Lehi did indeed cross the ocean and make it to the Americas. Uh, there's no claim that they're uh, the principal genetic phenotype that birthed all of the Native Americans or that, you know, I don't know, they torched the ice on the Bering Strait and made it so that, you know, they, they, they burned their ships so they couldn't go back. There's none of that. But in the 20s, there was a fervor and a respect for the American Indians that Mormons had that other people did not who were treating them very horribly. Uh, the same people that were driving them through the Trail of Tears and saying that blacks were inferior and deserved slavery were the people who are treating Mormons and Indians horribly okay and out of veneration for them the, the the Mormons that were writing the introduction tried to tie that ancient civilization talked about in the Book of Mormon to the principal ancestry meaning like uh, ancient ancestry of the American Indians okay so that was a new edition from the 20s that came a hundred years after the book was printed and yes it was silly it got tossed out and it got rewritten like in, in the next edition well, to say you have a very well-researched video on the Book of Mormon and that it's so well-researched that you can go head-to-head -head with FAIR, okay? There's 15 articles in FAIR about this trope. So if you're really that well-researched, you are at best <laughs> misrepresenting also, yourself. Also, put yourself in his shoes. He is 100% going to be- I can't. They don't fit and his beanie's too tight. <laughs> oh, my <The> God. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's just going to outright, like- get rid of anything that comes out of fair right he's not going to look at that as real evidence right now like in in an ex-mormon perspective that, that is not going to be valid in, in the world of ex-mormonism that's all just dismissed as not, not being real evidence it's it's just apologetics so yeah. once you put it in the category of apologetics then it can simply be brushed aside yes now did you notice where he zoomed in on where it said the principal ancestors mm-hmm that it did not say principal, as in P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L, like the main ancestors. Mm. It said principal, Ooh. like you have good principles. So I don't know, was that actually misspelled in the Book of Mormon? Huh. And well, if it was He did a little animation over the word. Yeah. Oh so my gosh, he misspelled the that word. Might have been VFX. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. VFX team misspelled the word. Wait, oh, that's I, hilarious. I, I, I didn't catch that. Well, so look on your screen right now, bro. He said the principal ancestors of the American Indians. And then in order to complete the animation, he scratched it out, but that's not the original font when he showed the change of among. Yet if you actually open up your Book of Mormon, Don Bradley brings up a really good point here. If you actually open up your Book of Mormon, Principal is spelled. Well, I can't take the bicker tonight. One, sorry, uh, Josh. We, you, you didn't saddle Anyone yourself. Anyone got a problem pre twenty thirteen? Here we go. Yeah. I go on. right here. No, this is. Uh, when this are would these be, scriptures from? This, I think it is. Oh yeah, principal P A L. Yeah, right. it's but principal he put P A L. But, and, but he just said that my copy right here has the thing. Like why? That's weird. So it was supposed yeah. to be. So, a so picture I told you he rushed so, it. So his shirt line. is not ironed. So I, it's actually <laughs> not fair. really his old copy that had said principal because if mm -hmm. it did, it would have said P A L. Yeah. So this is actually a copy where they're adding the word in. Mm -hmm. So or or maybe they found a new one because no, then, here it is. Because he wanted to do the reveal on a month. Right here, you look know? at this like, on in the on the introduction. Above my first bolding, you can see it says the principal, P-R-N-C-I-P-A-L. Yeah, I bet you that was somebody on his animation team. Who didn't know how to spell the, just, who didn't I'm know telling how to spell you, the between word. the framing, the, the, the unironed shirt, I think he rushed this. Yeah, and, and and I could see them, like, he maybe his Book of Mormon has the thing in it. And then they were like, hey, for the wipe away we need among the ancestors. Yeah, you're a 21-year-old yeah. pothead New York filmmaker who's up at 3 a.m. doing this for the deadline before Johnny yells at you at 10 a.m. in the morning <laughs> and you're just out clubbing. You're going to spell principal wrong. <laughs> By the way, you know what we need to do? We need to get merch that's a Johnny Harris beanie. I can't believe you noticed that. That was that's that the first was thing I solid. noticed. <laughs> that was gosh, <laughs> cool. Wow, that's such a Can I say something that I noticed? Yeah, yeah. There was there was one sentence in that clip that jumped out to me more than anything else in the video yeah. because I thought it was going to be the typical. There's no archaeological, geographical, linguistic evidence for the Book of Mormon, but he didn't say that. He said four Jews coming over in 600 BC, and mm. to me, those goalposts went. Like, yeah, because there had to have been at least 30 to 50. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah, because you you say the whole Book of Mormon, 
and then you get into a lot of stuff. But yeah. then if you then there's you the Jaredites down like oh, he did to that. there's no evidence for Jews coming in 600 BC. Like okay, those goalposts just got way tinier all of a sudden, and and, and why? Ah, and that is the a fact fascinating that he put point. in a yeah, fair sh- right after that. Yeah, hey, show me. Seems your, like he's aware of some stuff. Show me your ancient civilization. No, I'm specifically talking. That's interesting. Show yeah, me your aware of things over. like chiasmus in the Book of Mormon. Show me your ancient civilizations vo- versus show me your Jewish boats. Right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. Like okay, yeah, it's very, very. Okay. And I guess another fascinating thing about that with this like Book of Mormon geography stuff, I. I don't know, dude. I think there's some really compelling evidence out there. Like some of the Brian Stubbs work on Udo Aztecan and That's the what I was thinking of. It, so that's that is evidence not that's evidence for the Book of Mormon, but it's actually specifically evidence that ancient Jews came over to the New World. Yeah. Which is exactly what he's saying there is an evidence. What's this for. Udo Aztecan evidence? Uh, Just thirty second version because we have to keep going. So there is a language family. I was talking to Brad, the, not you. Quit hogging the, the time, Don. The Utah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. The Utah Aztecan language family. So it's actually U- Uto as in Utes, the Utes in Utah. Okay. So the Ute Indians in Utah, their ancestors came from down in Mexico. They were related to the Aztecs. And if you look at their language family, their, their sort of family of interrelated languages, it has significant overlaps with Hebrew. That's what he showed. And so that would be throughout. evidence that ancient Hebrews may have come over. And this always gets ignored. Like yeah. people, people, I, I, maybe because they just don't get what's going and, on. And, and just remember, Johnny Harris's appeal to authority, where he basically puts the book up in the air and says like, oh, this can't be and it's a bunch of silly nonsense. Why? Because the establishment says, oh, no way, you know, with that funny little smirk. Don't forget, this is the establishment that told us for years that cloth the masks were going to stop COVID. This is the establishment where James Lindsay, James Lindsay wrote 12 articles, one of them which was a translation of Mein Kampf, where instead okay, of saying okay, Jews, okay, okay. he said uh, the patriarchy <laughs> and was able to get into an academic journal, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Freaking Garden, Adolf Hitler's we have Mein a, Kampf. Garden, this is the same establishment. No, Garden, this is all an right? independent YouTuber <laughs> yeah, okay. who you've now just juxtaposed with James Lindsay <laughs> and Anthony Fauci and he's got nothing to do with either of those people. Yeah. He stole he wrote, are you mad my he, beanie. Are you mad because he wrote for Vice? Like, what is this? Oh, man. And know. Vice was started by your boy Gavin McInnes. Uh, was he writing for them or just doing videos? Like, No, what? he founded Vice Magazine, and then Vice, the uh, online magazine, ended up becoming a derivation thereof. But he was kicked out of his own magazine, just like uh, Steve Jobs was kicked out of Apple and oh. so on and so forth. And by the way, he's not my boy. I never met him. He does call me quite frequently. <laughs> but um, Does he I'm really? Just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. The fact you believe that, though, is pretty awesome. So... Um, Anyway, let's keep going and well, see. Cardin, I want to know that how much of your frustration toward what Johnny Harris is saying is uh, being guided by your blinders and your slight prejudice from your time in New York City that you are now imposing upon him. I think part of it is. Oh, no, I know these. I always tell people, I speak from direct experience. It is these people uh, that convince the, who? The, 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 who? The beanie people. <laughs> the unironic beanie hipster William Berg people. No, I'm just kidding. These um, people, usually <laughs> something terrible <laughs> follows. There might be some kind of prejudice lurking there. The people that purposely dress homeless and eat at Whole Foods, the overpriced oats. Hey, but he's, Carter, you know, <laughs> We talked in our live stream about how psychedelics help with PTSD. Maybe they're, they're doing clinical studies, I completely man. admit I have PTSD. No, actually, it was these arguments, these woke arguments have actually done a lot of damage in my personal relationships, especially that mm. my family. I had four people in my ward who were convinced by a follower of John DeLynn um, under the woke argument that the Mormon church is a patriarchy and you as a woman need to express your sexuality against that patriarchy. And so there was uh, a person who remained nameless that I know, there's actually a family a member of mine that adopted all of these exact same arguments against the church and they convinced four ladies in our ward to cheat on their husbands and there's like now like 16 or 17 kids without mothers and parents vapid divorce i think it ended up ultimately contributing to the early demise of one of the husbands like there are real world consequences for all of this woke social justice garbage and that woke social justice garbage always starts with secularization and any kind of insinuation that if you're stupid if you believe is always the gateway drug to ultimately what will become the legal uh, the 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 lethal overdose in, in in families that i have seen firsthand so yes Am I jaded? Yes, one hundred percent. But you just pushed all. You're like the chick 
when a guy takes you on a first date and she's like, when well, my ex is really abusive because he called and you're like, whoa, 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 I just wanted to get sushi. That's <laughs> yeah. what you're doing to Johnny Harris. For real. Okay? This if is going to be his first time the, seeing anything of you. You're and trauma it's dumping. Be, on. Your, your first date with Johnny Harris is going terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if I am hot enough, to reach the threshold of what you would consider attractive enough on a first date, I am flat. How is that what you got out of this? I am, I am saying, <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Play the clip. Jeez Louise. Hey, I just put you back on your heels, bro. That's never happened before. <laughs> That's never happened before, dog. Come over here. Give me a hug, you. No, I'm just kidding. Here we go. Johnny Harris keeps going. My Book of Mormon says the Lamanites, these people who came over from Jerusalem, are, quote, the principal ancestors of the American We're Indians. From the beginning. And a few years ago, they did change that to the Lamanites being among the ancestors of the American Indians. And unsurprisingly, there's a whole community also, of uh, believers. Quick, yeah. just don't you want a religion to, like, update things as much as, like, to according to the knowledge that they have? Yeah, that's there's, true. I don't By see way, anything wrong with that. That's not scripture that part it's not scripture yeah. at all that's bruce r mcconkey giving an introduction he was wrong about a lot <laughs> yeah for real okay well let's keep going i'm just i'm just getting yeah. back to the spot that we yeah. were it's only 10 seconds ahead who work to validate that this is actually a historic record but no in reality there's no archaeological genetic or linguistic evidence that supports the book of mormon's assertion that Jewish people migrated to the Americas around 600 BC. And that's just also just not true. Brian Stubbs, Uto Aztecan. Yeah, that's not Looking true. There, there's linguistic, there's all kinds of genetic. Let's uh, have this guy meet some black Hebrew Israelites. Uh, yeah. <laughs> also, uh, do the fighting for us. <laughs> genetics a fascinating one. Genetic is a really fascinating one, considering what happened when the Spanish came to the U like to the Americas and the way that like the expectation that we would have any level of like genetic evidence of a colony from Lehigh after like the number of people who died just shows an abject misunderstanding of the way that DNA works. And also of hemispherical history. And also they can never explain any of the anomalies. They can always cast aspersions on somebody else's claim, but they can never actually back up their own claims. I always say, okay, cool. Well, if you think that it's all bunk and garbage, explain Austro-Melanesian DNA in South America. Well, they, they clearly are still thinking of a Clovis first type of like story for the Native Americans here, which I think is going to change in the next couple of can years. I, can I? Yeah, let me comment on this. So yeah. when I was outside of the church and I was in my own like Johnny Harris, right? Like my own ex-Mormon phase. Well, right? you guys are both wearing um, earth toned shirts. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there yeah. you go. There you go. And um, when I was there, I actually I actually, one of the minor things that I was grateful to the LDS Church for in my upbringing was that I had always been given the idea that it was an open question whether there was immigration from the old world to the new uh, before mm. Columbus, that there might be pre-Columbian contacts. Yeah. I looked in the scholarly literature and there was such a strong reaction against the old racist views that you know, civilization could have only formed in the old world and had to be diffused by whites or whatever to the new world. There was you such know. a strong reaction to that that they went to the other end of the pendulum and they became very dogmatic in saying there were no contacts before Columbus. And that's just closed-minded. That's an yeah. empirical question. It's a dogmatic that's, that's, thing. It's not, you can't just decide by your ideology this didn't happen, mm -hmm. right? Like, like you need to be open to evidence. And so I was always open to the possibility that there were these old world contacts. So That's I think to awesome. close that door, you're just trading one ideology for another ideology yeah. instead of being open to evidence. Absolutely. And I think it holds true also for the archaeological question. You know, uh, Johnny Harris's YouTube channel was actually founded by black people. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? Only Cardi gets that joke right now. <laughs> um... <laughs> no, the, our audience would get that joke because the, the, the video came out. That, that's one of the top 10 things that black Christians believe that their white friends don't know about. That we found in Remember, every country. He did that whole video <laughs> oh. saying that, you know, <laughs> that, it, that's funny. That's hilarious. So, um, all right, let's keep going. As someone who has read this book dozens of times, I can tell you that when you're a believer, this is a really compelling piece of work. You can read these pages, and you can read about the stories and mm -hmm. the lessons and the metaphors, and you can take a lot from it. And the it's almost as though it's complex literature, which would be 
you know, frauds don't look better with time. They look worse. And the Book of Mormon keeps looking better, which makes you think it's probably not. Cardin, but let him finish. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I, he, I'm paper. agreeing with him, yeah. That's a, okay. that's a very good explanation from work. someone who knows. You can read reads. these. Okay, say what you had to say, Luke. Sorry. Oh, that's a, that's a great thing to say from somebody who no longer believes. Like, yeah, for sure. Props to him for giving it that level of respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh yeah, props. Yes, great guy. <laughs> Garden, so ahead, jaded. Garden. <laughs> <laughs> I am leaning into this meme. All right. These pages, and you can read about the stories and the lessons and the metaphors, and you can take a lot from it. And the biggest thing that you take from it is that it is proof that Joseph Smith was actually called of God to prepare the world for the second coming, that he was a legitimate prophet. You're right. Oh, we, we say it is the proof of his calling as indeed, yes. Or a, at prophet. the very least evidence in favor of, you know. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, here's the last one right here. Joseph Smith's teachings as referenced by Johnny Harris. Here we go. It was super unique and super potent and super polarizing. You either believed that Joseph Smith was an incredibly inspired prophet who was like revealing the truth that none of us had ever heard before, or he was just a brilliant creative visionary inventing this elaborate plan to dupe people, which is what a lot of people in his village started to think as he started to gain followers. I would yeah. say it was before, but anyway. No, I think that's a reasonable presentation yeah. of it. it it's, yeah. it's, it's, I don't have a problem. With it's it's were, layman's There term. were a number of people with Joseph, contemporaries of Joseph, that went with like, he's an idiot route. And and now the maybe this is the consensus. Now I'm not into the scholarship as much as Don, but now it's kind of swung around to he's a genius. He came up with all this stuff. Part, but that wasn't like the original agreed upon narrative. Yeah. It's it's fluctuated between a lot of different things. And this That's is fair this too. is actually why people in Joseph Smith's time so readily glommed on to some version of Spalding Rigdon theory. Yeah. Because they're basically saying Joseph Smith was way too stupid and ignorant to have written this book. So it must be from this book that no one has seen that like he must have seen and then they find it later and it has nothing to do with it. <laughs> okay, well, let's keep going. So, 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 say. so Don, from a historian's point of view, is that kind of a red flag when people who were contemporary with him came up with one theory? And then people later removed from him have something that's a very different theory? I mean, not, not necessarily. It's definitely something that draws attention, right? Because then you wonder, why is there the difference between the people at his time and the people later? Like it's, if this was so blatantly obvious, yeah. shouldn't people around him have been able to figure it out? It's a surprising contrast, the degree to which he okay. was... Uh, declared an ignoramus in his time. That's that's one of the exact words that was used. And the extent to which now he is lauded as be, having been uh, brilliant, creative. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Here we go. Let's finish up seeing what he got to say. Missouri is like the Holy Land. The epicenter for the end of the world and the Garden of Eden is in Missouri. Okay, but not so fast. The locals like are not into them. Yeah, the locals definitely were not into it. Missouri ain't notorious is, is for having Is he been going nice kind of unscripted for this? I don't know, but he did throw his Bible down. He's usually a little more scripted. In. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, whatever. That's just what he chose. Uh, pause, right? Wait, wait. You see the bottom of the screen? Yeah, what? He's dirtying the screen, obviously, with the desk, but then he's, but got, he's like got a his backpack. Emmy. No, no. Move over more to his the right. Backpack under There's the like a. I think you rushed this video, guys. I think he rushed it. No, he says that he's been spending years trying to do Well, this. he's been spending I, years thinking about it, but like not executing I on think it. he had like eight projects to do I got to tell you, whoever <laughs> was framing this made sure to put his Emmy in there. He's flexing. Yeah. yeah. You know what? That wasn't even the original shot. He just really did such a bad job yeah. at the end of editing. He's looking look, well, at the end of the day, look, <laughs> it's, a, it's a cohesive video. Let's keep going. See what he has to say. Locals like, are not into them. They start to get scared that the Mormons are plotting a takeover of their private property, all in the name of building Zion, and they're not going to stand for it. They want the Mormons out. Pause. What? What do you mean by private property? Like we're taking their pools? Uh, it's, <laughs> what is it like? it's a little bit weird for him to make the private property case when Joseph Smith was running on a presidential platform against slavery. 
Oh, yeah, he lays out hard. and so so that's the thing. One of the one of the big things that were the people around was the pro freed slaves coming to. You have a fascinating Missouri. history. He, he of was that. joining the. He Saints. was an emancipationist for sure, but also he yeah. like fully denounces that at one time to try to stop persecution. Right. Well, he he says he's not mm-hmm. an abolitionist, but yeah. he, he he's clearly an emancipationist. Mm-hmm. Um, which are well, two and, things. And that wasn't Joseph Smith. I I forget the name of the. That was W. W. Phelps. Started W. Phelps yeah. freed, freed, uh, freed who started people the paper, article, yeah. and okay. that was kind of the spark. I mean, obviously, there was just the general tension of a lot but, of new and different but people moving in. What's mean by in. property? Like we're taking their houses? Is that what he's, or just we're moving no, into the cities? Moving in, they're purchasing property that was for sale instead of it laying empty, and then all of a sudden, you're not taking the it for sale. Yeah. The, the, he, it, the way he said it kind of alluded that they we're like yes. stealing their jungle gyms. And stuff. He cast <laughs> aspersions. Well, no, he's saying that this was the perception, and and the perception from the yes. non Mormons in Missouri yeah. was quite bad. They really mm. thought the Mormons were trying to take over. So, mm. I mean, I, I historians I think, on his side, we're good. Yeah, the fact that he's <laughs> trying to present what they were thinking, I think, makes it fine. Okay, I, let's right, keep going. Bradley cool. for the save. By the way, does anybody else notice that he kind of looks like Jacob Hansen? No, he you does. Know? Actually, he looks yeah. a lot like Jacob Hansen. I actually, there, there when I first saw this video online, I thought I was, I thought it was Jacob Hansen, just because I saw an image of his face, and I thought ah. oh, it was. Mormons out, oh, yeah. so they start sabotaging them with violence. The Mormons are driven out. Notice that all of the violence, the thousands of bullets, the mortars, the lynchings, all of that from got Beanie boiled people. down to one sentence like, yeah, the Missourians were pissed and they got violent and driven them out. Now back to him being a crazy psychopath. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, actually, I thought this part was pretty cool. Okay, let's watch it then. Or of these revelations, and he's pushing the belief system of Mormonism further and further from mainstream Christianity. Oh, yeah, he did the head tilt. He the does the like, <laughs> like... It's the exorcist not, head tilt. Yeah, yeah, normal humans don't do that. And I wonder <laughs> if that was intentional or not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Makes you wonder, makes you wonder. Here we go. Joseph comes out and says there actually is no heaven and hell, but rather there are three kingdoms of heaven. All of us cool will be animation. sorted into these different kingdoms depending on how obedient we were here. on Mid-journey working overtime. On earth. How much we accepted Christ and repented of our sins. There's even a spiritual prison and paradise that you go to after you die, but before you're sorted into the kingdoms. And it's in Nauvoo where Joseph says that an angel appeared to him and demanded multiple times against his will that he take on multiple wives. Pause. Those wives. Yes. Don is smiling. Why are you smiling, bro? Why are you smiling, oh, Don? What's going on, buddy? It's just interesting how he's... Uh how he's framing it and the cha- the shift in the music, yeah. the ominousness and so on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. Fun fact, that's the RLDS painting of Joseph Smith. That's not oh, even ours. Oh, interesting. Ooh. That's not even We ours. always have them in blue and they always have them in red. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, they're U of U fans. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. All right, here we go. They're sealed to him. His first plural marriage is to a teenager, and he goes on to have 40. Oh, they did it again. Done. Okay, so they Uh. are showing the um, sort of modern artistic representation that is relying on uh, an account that we've talked about uh, elsewhere about um, Fanny Alger, Justice Smith supposedly marrying Fanny Alger in 1833. This account was written by... Mosiah Hancock in 1896, which is, you know, 63 years after the events that he's describing are supposed to have happened. It's an inaccurate account. And so necessarily the artist believing that account, which historians generally approach with a lot of skepticism, Mm -hmm. um, the artist using that account is portraying her as a 15 year old. She was actually 18. Yeah, and it's not the right picture. There's no picture. Uh, you said this was a picture of somebody else as well anyway, right? No, th- this is no, this is the one that there's an artist who in her effort to humanize Joseph Smith's wives, um, she just came up with drawings. Now, we have no photographs of Fanny Alger, and so this is solely from her imagination and based on the idea that she was 15. Oh, okay, but it's inaccurate. And is it's saying. inaccurate, but like, like, how much would Johnny Harris have known that it was inaccurate? I don't. It think was he exhaustively known. researched. <laughs> he knew everything. He's been planning this for years. He's been worried about it. This is his magnum opus. Damn Honestly, it! Honestly, here's here's the thing. Actually, uh, if Johnny Harris, I, I wonder if he ever sees this in any way. 
Uh, would you be willing, Don, to like assist him in his research if he wants to work on further videos to help him understand like uh, absolutely the real sure. story of Mormonism? Yeah, because you having been somebody who is like had been faithful, then left the church and then come back, but you definitely know these sources more than literally anyone else on the planet. I I don't know if his commitment is to truth. I think having access to a scholar like Don would make a huge difference. Well, if his motivation is to present truth, he would take that offer. And uh, if it's I mean, to cast in approaching versions, something if like he that, it. in approaching a project like that, what I would do would not be to try to obviously to get a non-believer to present a believing perspective because yeah. that wouldn't be authentic to what he sees. For sure. It would yeah. just be to try to help like make sure the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, the information is accurate. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so here we go. And speaking Major. of that, and he is goes on 40 or did he say over 40? Is that the actual number that's agreed upon for the wives? Or I guess when I say agreed upon, it's what you think since you're the one that knows this uh, stuff. I mean, a more standard number that, would be in the 30s, but the that's, it's, not a, it's not a crazy number. It's close enough. It's okay. like still more than 10 more wives than any of us in this room have. So Yeah, for real. Rock on. So here we go. It's pretty big. Going on with Johnny Harris to have 40 wives in just three years. Many of them were married to other people, but then were sealed to Joseph the prophet. What I find striking here is that up until this point, you have this meticulous documentation of every single revelation and theology rule and new policy in the church here in what's called the Doctrine and Covenants. But polygamy stayed quiet and private. I wonder if it had anything to do with like getting run out of Missouri and having all of their printing presses burned. Since we're about to talk about the Nauvoo Expositor and yeah. people tend to conveniently forget the the LDS guys had their own printing press destroyed just before this and there were no government repercussions. I wonder if Johnny's going to say, hey, they shouldn't have burned down the LDS printing press either, right? And those parents that, that had to watch their those children that had to watch their parents get slaughtered and then the children that were slaughtered uh, saying, oh, they're just going to grow up to be Mormons. And those kids had to grab what is now the, the s we wouldn't have some of the doctrine and covenants and these holy writings and the revelations of Joseph Sis now. Now, if not for the children that in the same building where like their parents were, were shot, they, they, they grabbed like manuscripts and ran out. What's that story? Oh, Mary yeah. Elizabeth Rollins and her sister saved the manuscripts. Yeah. yeah and, and her, in, in the, vi the mob violence of that week, weren't her parents shot? Uh, I don't believe so. Not her parents. Um, Answer there, me this question, were, guys. Would America okay. be better off if we could destroy a couple of news places without any real? Uh, <laughs> I'm just saying. I bet Amer. I b if if we could. You're just saying that um, no more freedom of the press is the moderate position. <laughs> that, that, that's <laughs> oh what gosh. you're saying, right? Okay. <laughs> Here we are, Johnny Harris, who didn't agree with Joseph, decide to publish a newspaper in Nauvoo that criticize him for polygamy and generally his leadership. Joseph is done messing around at this point. He's become very militant and he responds by- <laughs> Oh, he's become very militant. He's, he's never... the one who's done messing around at this point. <laughs> like that's literally like saying, oh, you know, those slaves that had that slave revolt, they, they were just done messing around. They, 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 you know, just, you can't trust them. They get violent. I mean, they he's... were tortured. Yeah, he's clearly swallowed this like Joseph Smith as a con man and charlatan narrative hook line and sinker at this point. Wait, are you guys saying that the 19th century was not like a time in which people were like tolerant? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I thought everyone if you were different it was wonderful. This guy is the party I, of no Jim clue. Crow and slavery and he is here to talk about tolerance, please. No, no, no. I, I just think it's funny to like hear someone talk about this in a way that they like as position Joseph Smith as though he had like any real power here. I know the guy is establishing himself as like this ruler in Nauvoo, but he he only is making courts that can like stop him from getting pulled away into other places because those courts are going to kill him. Right. Like Missouri. when when you understand, like when you look at the context of the history, Joseph Smith's actions make a hundred percent sense. And I think Johnny Harris, put yourself in his shoes, you probably would have done the same He'd thing. He'd been in prison in the basement of a prison where he couldn't stand for nine months. 
where if you lit a fire to keep yourself from freezing to death, you got smoke inhalation. He'd had children die because the mob had burst into his house, beat half of his friends and his family to practical death already, causing tra uh, traumatic brain injury on Sidney Rigdon, okay? And then us watch his child die. The saints have been driven west, lost all their property. Zion's camp had already happened. They finally make it to some place where there's a, a little bit of, of, of relative peace. And you're gonna say that, oh, he's just not messing around. This guy buried his children due to mob violence and Johnny Harris's ignorance of that. If, if you study the history, it's just, it makes me incensed when these little hipsters act like somebody who is defending himself and his family and his children is some kind of aggressor. It's wildly ignorant. And just wildly ignorant. But here's the deal. It seems that like in the research that was done, they came across probably, I don't know, it feels CES letter-esque to me in a way and and maybe they're focused very very much on joseph smith as like a power hungry sex maniac you know mm -hmm. like as a very standard ex-mormon narrative sort of thing well, he's and no so, different like, than the course, christian Oops. but but then he's an oppressor right and so yeah. he is this oppressive force that needs to be taken out in some way yeah. and I, I don't know i that's it seems to be what he's presenting but that's not the real story of mormonism there's a couple of facts that they just continuously, not only Johnny, the, the Book of Mormon having no archaeological evidence, uh, he's about to say Joseph Smith commands people to go and destroy the press when when really it would be better, and I'm like, I'm trying to help you, Johnny, like have better arguments. It'd be better to say there's not strong or scholarly agreed upon evidence for the Book of Mormon. That'd be a much better statement. Yeah. And it'd be a much better statement to say, people in Nauvoo, what was it, the city council debated and unanimously agreed to destroy the press. It's okay for you to still come to the conclusion that that was a wrong and wild thing to do, but at least present it in the full context instead of, it seems like every time it's no archaeological evidence for the Book of Mormon. He obviously married the, the girls for sex and then he, he went and destroyed the press. No, 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 dude. Himself Joseph, because this, he's militant. Joseph messed up. We all know the 19th century uh, minorities were not treated poorly at all. And so I don't know where they're getting this idea <laughs> that like, Mormons as a minority were, have, had an unfair shake. Yeah. Do you know that the Missouri extermination order was like one of only, I think, at, up to that point, like two or three documents that literally treated another fellow human being, except for the American Indians and black slaves, were treated as the slaughter of cattle, less than a misdemeanor. Okay. But you Cardin, know, what like, were they wearing? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's uh, a yeah. joke, but I mean, this is literally. Yeah, the, like, the, literally. Know, yeah. It's, I mean, to say that, oh, they're not. Johnny Harris, there was a Mormon extermination order placed upon members of the church. He in mentions Missouri. that in the video, doesn't he? Then he should, then how can he just turn around and say, oh, well, now Joseph Smith wasn't messing around. I, I don't know, dude. Like, I just. See, I, I don't know if he was saying it with. I know, because you want to be friends with all these guys. You want to be Wait. friends with Mike Winger. You want to be friends with Johnny Harris. You want to, oh, I just want to. Not We're, Jim Bennett. No. <laughs> you know what? No. You do not no, like no, Jim no. Bennett, Luke. Never accuse me of that. Uh, no. <laughs> Luke okay. and Jim I'm joking. I'm joking. fight. As they should. I, I was just saying, I don't know why they can't give the slightly more nuanced and slightly more correct view while still upholding their own. Well, because they don't have with these things. that view. Yeah, I think if he like had a more correct view, you can view. still say it's bad to destroy the press, while also putting in there that they deliberated on this for a couple of hours and unanimously came to a decision on that. Like, well, you, you know, you, it's okay to put that yeah. detail in that's true from history, while still saying, and and it was wrong, and that's what made people mad. You, you, you can do a version and call it the Gospel according to Luke. Oh, ah, <laughs> that's funny. All right, last thirty seconds of the video I feel right like here. It'd be a cheap knockoff. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Last thirty seconds. Decide to publish a newspaper in Nauvoo that criticize him for polygamy and generally his leadership. Joseph is done messing around at this point. He's become very militant, and he responds by sending his militia to destroy their printing press. So he's become very militant. He's. I'm sorry. Like, oh, why yeah. is why is this a big deal? Like, why do they act like that is really These such are they, unacceptable? They always ignore. They always ignore. He absolutely had legal reasoning that would suggest he had the power to do so. Not only from Nauvoo's city charter, but also from Blackstone, and the, there was like law books that they had prepared 
prepared a case for in court they were going to present their case. They, that's why they went to Carthage in the first place. And it was before the state's right of freedom of the press, so they're and, using a presentist oh, argument. Also, they had just seen their own printing press burned down, and no one was punished for and that. And these so, are the guys that make their bones writing strongly worded letter, letters to try and get people canceled by their HR departments. <laughs> Cancel culture is the party of Johnny Harris. But I just right? don't get like why antis are always like, can you believe? The unforgivable sin of burning the they uh, a and mob then they hunted. suddenly enshrine freedom of like, my great the great press. great grandpa got chased by a mob and was lynched and literally got saved at the last minute before he died. This is the kind of country we're in. They're acting like that, and that was like a, a Wednesday. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> that was a norm. He's acting like this is so terrible. Like I don't understand, and not just Johnny. Why are anti so into the? Can you believe? The destruction of a printing press that's literally an appetizer i i want yeah. not a big deal like, at all the, sorry so i have been studying those records to try to understand a little bit more about the martyrdom and studying about like the destruction of the nauvoo expositor the more i read about it the more i think it was the right move like interest i don't know i i just think when you look at the actual context surrounding it i know that sounds so anti-american to say that like hey you freedom of the press yeah guess what that was only for the federal government, not for states. These are the same people that are trying to send the FBI to hunt down people that made Trump memes. Okay. Okay. okay These Garden. are the same people. Where are you going hunting with this? You're folks down? So <laughs> right? Go look at Johnny Harris's social media. Ask him if he thinks the January six uh, insurrectionist should be in prison. Like, <laughs> how does that? How does that? <laughs> it's always apply. the people that get pissed about the printing press. They're the big. They're always the progressives that are all in far favor of all conservatives getting canceled from their jobs. Fox News getting taken off of the so, airwaves. Yeah. Like the modern party of censorship is the, the the secular progressive left, and Johnny Harris self identifies as a member of the modern secular progressive left. And so uh, if, okay, if, okay, if, I, I, yeah. all right, okay, I'll oh, allow. And, it. <laughs> and, and, and here's one thing I just want to addend to. Addend? Is that a word? Uh, one thing that I want to say in addition, like with them destroying the printing press, at the very most, I think if they had lost in court, they would have just had to buy them a new printing press. Yeah. Joseph Smith being extrajudicially killed over it was not the right like punishment for that crime if it was one. Mm, but the I courts couldn't establish that saying. it was. And I don't think that's what Johnny's saying. I don't think so either. Yeah. Okay, I well, well, let's, let's deal. finish so this one. Definitely, there's a very strong case that the Nabu Charter did actually allow them to do what they did and other things that Brad is saying. There is in the U.S. like such a strong tradition of freedom of the press. This is seen as, as the Bill of Rights is in general, just as like sacrosanct, like totally sacred, right? And so it's understandable that this would be seen as sort of like a sin against American democracy. Also, and the 19th as, century was really big on human rights. <laughs> yes, <laughs> as far as <laughs> indeed, as far as um, you know, like the best decisions and worst decisions that Joseph Smith made. I mean, given that this one is a big part of what ended up getting him killed, this is not a decision that I look back on and say. Oh yeah, that was the best thing to do, mm. right? For for multiple reasons. So definitely, I think we can look at this as Latter Day Saints and say, yeah, that was a mistake. Was it the sort of um, was it on the level of mistake that people put it, right? I I think in its context, it looks different. If I was him, I not only I would have burned the printing. Pr it would it would have been. A lot worse. Yeah, I, I, I would have <laughs> oh been gosh. far worse, dude. Though, do John C. Bennett would have been headless naked in the street. The guy would have, <laughs> oh it would have been gosh. over. These mofos would have. Oh <laughs> my <laughs> gosh! You're like Sam Hyde, who's like, if she puts me in a self defense situation, <laughs> they have. If she no ever put me clue. in a self defense situation, I would blank. You know, just they like, have no clue I, <laughs> how nice Joseph I am not was. Not the one getting clipped by apology at this time. <laughs> <laughs> That's you funny. This video. All right, so here's the last. Finally, I've said the last <laughs> 26 seconds like five times. Let us finish the video. Here's Johnny Harris. Destroy their printing press. He declares martial law. And now the government of Illinois, who had given them this sort of safe charter, sees this chaos 
and they're not into it. And they arrest right. Joe. Pause, 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 pause. You're telling pause, me pause. Governor Ford was like completely unaware of the situation up to For, this Wait, wait, point. wait, wait, wait. This. All right, look, Johnny, I'm, I'm, I'm still on your side. <laughs> he declares martial law. Okay, so do let's you know, first. Do you know why? Um, I'll, I. I know that um, if my the women that I, in my church are uh, being uh, raped by mobs, if houses are being burned, if they're telling me, hey, we're going to kill you <laughs> a lot, and I say, wow, if they publish this nuisance, more people are going to die. I've already had to dig enough graves. Oh, and there's a mob coming after me. I think all of those are good enough reason to... to for sure, anyone else in his position would have, had he not, and more people died, these same people, journalists would have been saying, and he was so careless and, and, and didn't do anything mm -hmm. as his people were getting killed. It would have been a lose-lose. I'm they, sorry. They say <laughs> the declare martial law as though it was him, like, flexing his power when it's really, like... A last ditch effort to save as many of his people as also, possible. We're talking nineteenth century martial law in a city, and when you say martial law, you're assuming like what is that movie that came out ten years ago where there are no more laws for a weekend? You the know, purge. the purge. The purge. You purge. think of like purge, like like I can't go outside and the jets are flying over. Like I'm so. I just no. It's cruel. Yeah, this I is mean, cruel just, history. It, it it reminds me of like what the the headlines that they were running about Malcolm X, how he had it coming. Yeah, it's like good. He deserved it, and it's like, Ugh. like well, how, how do you? How can you? Like really? Like you, you deserve? It? I don't know how he has no sympathy. And these are his people. I don't. I don't think he has any sympathy for the yeah, church anymore. Look, I, I know, but still, it's in his blood. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you you don't do that. You don't. You, Joseph Smith, Johnny Harris. You might not be here without Joseph Smith. How can you? You know. Do away and to be with fair. To be fair, though, I I really appreciate like the partial testimony that he bears near the end. Oh yeah, because it's freaking testimony. I, no, no, no. Now. When when he talks about how it was like really meaningful to him, and the way that like he really valued everything that he had learned as, as a, long a as it saint. is couched in the framework that you're, he was stupid when he believed. I'm just imagining Joe yeah. Smith li watching this video in heaven, going. Yeah, when I got shot, a bunch of fell out of a window so you could have rights, and then you're you're dragging me through the mud. At least I'm happy you felt good, Johnny. This he is no different. This is no fair. different than RFM yeah. when he talks about graduating from Mormonism. Look, and I am trying so hard <laughs> to defend this guy. <laughs> Joseph okay, Smith is in heaven right now. Let's get through like, the video. <laughs> let's get through the video. I, I want to talk done. to him about this so bad. He gets locked up in jail, and two days later, a mob of more than 200 men storm this jail. They climb up to the second floor where Joseph and his brother are, and they shoot at him. He tries to jump out the window, and he falls to his death. They just shot at him, and he fell to his death. Actually, he didn't die on the bottom. He was dragged back up, laid up against the well, and then summarily executed by five people in a firing squad at nearly point blank. Um, in a very gruesome and bloody fashion. And it does not appear that he jumped. Out the no, window. he was shot no. in the he back actually, and it launched him out. Um, there's indication he was giving the Masonic distress call out mm -hmm. the window. Yeah. Uh, because he was a Freemason, he expected Freemasons are under obligation to help each other, especially in life-threatening situations. Um, there's... It's uh, from what I understand, we know that there were Freemasons in the mob who killed him. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it was a Freemasonic conspiracy or something crazy. It wasn't. But like, um, like, so they would have been violating their Masonic oaths and so on. He's he's trying to save himself and the others in the room. Yeah. And he's killed in the process of doing so. Yeah. OK, so final thoughts, Don. You're the number one scholar on these things. You've been both in and out of the church. You've been in Johnny Harris's shoes. You've also been, you've touched and held the original manuscripts of Joseph Smith. What did you think about this whole thing? So I really thought that overall he is attempting to tell the story just as he sees it. He's attempting to tell yeah. it sympathetically. He's trying to avoid extremes like accusing Joseph Smith of plagiarism mm -hmm. and so on. Um, it's actually, as these things go, it's pretty tame. It's pretty moderate. Yep. It's attempting to be accurate. That's fair. Now, that's, that's an overall framework. But then, obviously, all of the things that we pointed out that are problematic, 
in the way that he's framing it. And, and not only, like I said earlier, not just in his story about Joseph Smith, he's also presenting a story about himself. Yeah. Right? And in that story, it's like, well, I used to believe this thing. And then like a part that we didn't go over, right? He's uh, didn't sh- play. He's saying, you know, like, well, I used to believe, but it was before I knew that Joseph Smith destroyed the printing press and about his polygamy and so on, right? And so there is this narrative that, well, this used to be believable to me, but then I discovered these things. These new facts, and by facts I mean crowdsourced ex-Mormon subreddit tropes that have been recycled in this social media blender for the past 10 years and are just literal rocket fuel for my anti-Mormonism. Yeah, that's what they mean by facts. But this this narrative that he gives about himself, it's really, it's the standard ex-Mormon narrative. Been there, I appreciate, I, I understand where that narrative is coming from. I would say the more that one digs beyond this level, right, the more that it becomes visible that actually, no, Joseph Smith was not an irreligious young man who, you know, takes on religion as a con. He was a sincerely religious child who grows up to be a sincerely religious man who believes in his own prophetic claims. And so there is certainly a much more, just like Johnny Harris gave a kind of sympathetic account in some ways of the Book of Mormon, right? His own experiences with the Book of Mormon were very positive. I think it would also be possible to give a much more sympathetic account here of Joseph Smith and to note the reasons for believing that Joseph Smith was sincere and how he did, he made real contributions to the world. He created the Latter-day Saint community that in a great number of ways has had a, a positive impact on the larger world. So even if you don't believe one of the things, I was having a close conver- a conversation with a close friend while I was out of the church and believed that Joseph Smith was an opportunist, and this friend believed the same thing. We were talking, and the friend had this observation that, you know, but this guy was a builder. He, like, built something enduring. He built this community that we are part of that has shaped us, yeah. you know. And so I think definitely there's room for a much more sympathetic positive view of Joseph Smith here. And a fascinating thing that I see happening when this is Johnny Harris almost treats it as though Joseph Smith has a superpower of storytelling, Mm -hmm. which in a fascinating way is an echo of Johnny Harris's own talent. It is. You know, I, I think he's kind of like putting that into the story of Joseph Smith in a way. And it may be a point where he sees something in common between himself and Joseph Smith. Yeah. Honestly. I, for one, think he's a filthy anti-Mormon. <laughs> that I, no, I just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Get it. A, dirty, <laughs> nasty, a dirty, nasty, filthy yeah, anti-Mormon. Yeah, yeah, Is that yeah, what I'm saying? Look, yeah. here, here's yeah, the thing. Yeah, yeah. This shares in common with the CES letter the assumption that if you still believe, you're an idiot. Yeah. And that just is an unhealthy way to interact with your former religion. I think... That Johnny's really a good guy. That you want to disassociate no, no, no. yourself from the worst things that I we've think, said. I think if you make if I think if you make the notes that we made here about uh, he actually was religious. The polygamy thing's different than he said. The Book of Mormon archaeology archaeology is different than he said. All that it actually is a very pretty well produced wrinkly shirt mm-hmm. aside video about church history and Joseph and, Smith. And weird like that I would be fine to show to head seminary things. kids. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you make like, here's these five points he didn't say that kind of changes the context a ton. And this is a great summary. I am on a road trip right now. Stopped at the Far West Temple site two days ago. And then today, uh, woke up in Nauvoo, went around Nauvoo, went over to Carthage, stood, looked out that window we were just talking about in Carthage today, a couple hours ago. Oh, man. And 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 Don is exactly right. Jo- Joseph Smith built something. Like you go to Nauvoo, you you see what was there, you see the temple, you see where they departed across the Mississippi into the unknown because of their faith in Christ and his restored church, and then into the Salt Lake Valley that I was just in uh, three days ago. This is not, just doesn't make sense to me. I I don't know what else he could be, but a, a sincere... The only way all the puzzle pieces fit together is if he's a prophet of God. Like, it doesn't make sense any other way. And I think when you look at the whole story and you take all the facts into account, even setting the spiritual witness aside, it's hard not to come to that conclusion. And 
I just think Joseph Smith is great, and the Saints Unscripted, uh, whatever your name is, who said we should take Face of the Man out of the hymn book, you're dead wrong, and I will fight you on that. That needs yeah. to stay in there. Okay, awesome. Great. Well, let us know where we go wrong. Let's keep the conversation going in the comments, and if you want to know more, check us out at wardradio.com. Right now.